ladies, would you stand with me as we worship? Ah, the microphone wasn't on. Well, speaking of things that weren't right, that groundhog kind of lied to us, didn't he? But have no fear. Revelation is in beautiful spring colors. So ladies, out in the lobby, we have vibrant spring colors and a sweet treat that we would love for you to gather and pass out to your friends and tell them about Revelation and the hope that it holds for us. And we have in April 11th, coming up in a couple of weeks, we have an opportunity. There's a mini study that's going to happen. This is a great time to invite friends or coworkers or 
the stranger in the grocery store to come and see what BSF is all about. And then we will also on April 11th have a welcome class where they can come and they can figure out just what we do here at BSF with the fourfold approach. So grab some spring this morning, even though there's a little bit of a chill, get your sweet treats and pass them out to all your friends and your neighbors. I want to um, introduce today, we have a blessing of having our area team here, Kelly Duncan and Tammy Weiss. Tammy, would you wave? Kelly's going to come up, but that's them over there in the corner. We're going to have Kelly come and speak to us this morning. Good morning, good morning. I'm curious. I'm curious what are the chances that I could find someone in this room who could either recite the books of the Bible or the seven I am statements of Jesus? You should have someone raise their hand. I'm not going to ask you to do it, but I think the chances are pretty high. Here's a tougher question. What are the chances I could find someone in this room who could tell us all the places in Nebraska where we have BSF groups meeting? Oh, that's a harder question. I'd put my money on Tammy. We've been on the area team serving together for the past eight or nine years, and we've prayed for a lot of groups to start and help facilitate that. But I think even if we put our heads together, if I'm honest, we couldn't name them all, and this is why. If you Google BSF find a group, this is what pops up. And then if you type the word Nebraska into that search bar and you select women and click search, you're going to discover there are 41 groups to choose from. The majority of these groups meet in local churches, just like this one. However, we have some groups meeting in some places you would not expect, like the public library in Ashland, and the ho- a hotel in Garing, and a train depot in Blair, and a retirement home in Scotts Bluff, and a coffee house, a delightful little coffee house in Stromsburg. What are the chances you have a friend or a family member who would love to be in BSF but who has no idea that there's a group meeting close by? Check out this map. All seven of our base classes are located in the eastern end of the state, Lincoln, Omaha, and Fremont. And, you know, they have a teaching leader like Toya who lectures live and a children's program. Some have two. Uh, and lots of discussion groups that meet throughout the building. But the other 34 groups we have meeting around the metro areas and outstate are satellite discussion groups. Some are small, 15 to 20 people, and they meet in a home. Some are medium-sized, three or four discussion groups, they meet in a church, and we even have some who are adding a children's program this year. Some are large. In fact, during uh, Tammy and my time as area personnel, we've had two of our large satellite locations grow to become base classes, and this is one of them, Lincoln Southwest. So let's shift our focus now in that map. Stop looking at the dots. Start looking at the cities with no dot. The first city that pops into my uh, view is Grand Island. It's the third largest city in Nebraska, no BSF. Then there's North Platte, so perfectly situated in the center of the state, no BSF. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a BSF group meeting up north in Valentine to take this um, wonderful study to to that part of the state? You know, our um, executive director, Holly Roberts, has shared her heart's desire that BSF be the most accessible Bible study on the planet. And we would all love that. Over the next few years, what are the chances that there'll be a few more dots up on that map? I think those chances are really high because God is on the move. He's at work. He's providing living water to people who are so thirsty for truth. Isaiah 43, 19 says this, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Let's pray. Uh, Suffering servant and victorious God, victorious king, we praise you this morning and we thank you for all the ways you are building your kingdom in us, in our homes, in our communities, and in your world. And Lord, as Toya comes to deliver the lecture today, I pray that um, you will prepare our hearts to receive your truth, that you'll transform us by your mercy and grace, and Lord, above all, that you will receive the glory and all the honor that's due your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Do I have any basket? Whoops. How are we not? Good. Any basketball fans here today? So are you watching March Madness? So if you're a basketball fan, you know we are in the middle of March Madness. And if you're not a basketball fan, March Madness is when the collegiate teams play each other to determine in a tournament to determine who's the best. It's the national championship. Well, in 2010, there was a game between Duke, who wins a lot of these national championships, and then there was this Cinderella team, the Butler Bulldogs. The score is 69 to 51. Duke's on the free shot line, makes the first shot, but misses the second shot. And the star player from Butler's team, Gordon Haywood, rebounds that ball, and he makes it to the halfway court line, 0.3 seconds to go. And he shoots this amazing three-pointer from the free shot line. And the crowd is silent, holding a breath. He almost made it. <laughs> but we know almost is still a loss. It's not a national championship. It was almost the greatest comeback shot, buzzer beater, but it wasn't. It was almost. In today's lesson, we see that Pilate almost does the right thing, but he doesn't. We know that Pilate eventually sends Jesus to his death. You see, almost doesn't cut it. There are no almost believers in heaven. And when Pilate is confronted with the truth about Jesus, he sticks himself in that dangerous space of the almost. The truth about Jesus reminds uh, demands a response from everyone. And almost believing in Jesus is the same thing as rejecting Jesus. Would you go to John 18, 28 through 40 with me? Our first division is Jesus questioned by Pilate. So Jesus has just been humiliated and beaten by these Jewish religious leaders. They, um, his disciples have abandoned him. Now the religious leaders, they've tied him up, and they're dragging him to Pilate's praetorium. So all that means is this is where Pilate would stay when he was in Jerusalem. Pilate preferred to stay in Caesarea because that's where all the fun happened. The, when he came to Jerusalem, this was kind of like a, a stick-in-the-woods place that he really did not enjoy being. But he had to come there on Jewish holidays because these pesky Jewish people tended to rise up in rebellion during the holidays. That may have had something to do with the, with the zealots there. So the zealots um, are people that were passionate about what they did, and they would increase the possibility during these Jewish holidays, they would create the rebellions. And they were so committed to their cause, they didn't mind going as far as to murder people, they did all kinds of nefarious things thinking they were doing the right thing because by these rebellious risings up, they thought that that might make the Messiah come quicker. They were called dagger men. So Pilate has this problem. He has this tiny little region, and the big problem is these Jewish people. They're a constant threat to an uprising to him. And Pilate, he can't allow these uprisings to happen because his job as a Roman prefect, or we might say a governor, his main two things is keep the peace, collect the taxes. And they are a constant threat for him keeping the peace. So the Jewish people don't like Pilate, and Pilate certainly doesn't like them. And so this balance that he has to do, so he will exert his authority over them, it kind of ticks them off, and then he'll have to back up a bit to appease them. So there's this constant give and take, which probably embittered Pilate even more to the Jews. Historians say that um, sometimes Pilate would even antagonize the Jews. Like, I think I have a slide on this. One time he brought in um, coins that had pagan symbols. 
Well, can you imagine pagan symbols being the currency in Jerusalem? They did not go over well. And then at one time he took, that he could take from the temple, would give, pay him some to do something, but he went in and he took a ton from the temple to build an aqueduct system. Well, all these type of things really ticks the Jews off. You see, when the Romans came in and conquered the Jews, they stripped them of all kinds of rights. So there is not this pleasantness between the Romans, Pilate, and the Jews. One thing that they stripped away from the Jews was they could not execute someone. So in today's lesson, we find that the Jewish people want to execute, crucify Jesus, but they can't, under Roman law, do it. So they have to go to this man that they don't like and ask for help. Some suggest that Pilate, this was just a suggestion, how he draws this trial out. Some say that that was antagonizing the Jews. That it was more about antagonizing the Jews. So the more and more they had to ask for help, the more and more power he had over them. Just a thought. Josephus, the historian, records Pilate as being greedy, violent, cruel, lots of other things. But let's see what the Bible says there in 18, 28 through 32. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. So don't just glaze over that not-so-nice conversation there between them. And Pilate says, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. We have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. So the Jews are urgently demanding that their Roman ruler, who has authority over them, they're demanding something of him. And see, they um, go to him, they're out in this courtyard, and they won't even set foot in his palace because they think he is so tainted as a Gentile that they wouldn't be clean to eat the Passover meal. So this is a theme we're going to see throughout this lesson today. Someone who is subordinate with less authority is demanding something from someone with superior authority. And so it's these role reversals of authority. These religious leaders, they need Pilate to kill Jesus, who has all authority. So they can go celebrate and eat the Passover meal. So they are trying to kill an innocent man so they can celebrate Passover. How much more dirty could you be than that? And see, part of the Passover was to celebrate Israel's freedom from the Egyptians. So celebrate their freedom from the slavery, celebrate their freedom from the cruelty of the Egyptians. But now, they themselves have become the cruel Egyptians to Jesus. Are we guilty of that, girls? Do we sometimes inflict the pain on someone else that has been inflicted upon us? So they're anxious to get to this Passover meal. And when the, the irony is, and God is so fun when he does stuff like this, the Passover meal, every course in that Passover meal points to Jesus, the Messiah that stands before them. And you see, their love of religion and comfort and their own way of life prevented any love of Jesus, the Messiah. They would go and they would eat their Passover meal with a lamb's blood on their hands. Let's go to 29. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? So we learn from the other Gospels what they accuse Jesus of with their lies. Now remember, when they started bringing Jesus here, the one claim was blasphemy. But between there and here, they realize blasphemy is not going to stand up in Roman court. So we've got to change it a little bit to tailor it to what we need to get. So first they say 
He's trying to overthrow Rome. Number two, he doesn't want you to pay taxes. He's opposing Roman taxes. And three, he's claiming to be king. And so Pilate is a master at reading the crowd. He is a practiced political manipulator. He was one of the longest prefectors that they had because he is a political master. And so he decides, he's reading this crowd, he thinks, I can take control of this situation against this angry crowd that wants to punish this innocent man. And Pilate almost gets it right. You see, Pilate wants to exercise some type of human morality where Jesus is concerned. Because i got to tell you, human morality, it changes with cultures, it changes with politics, and it changes with social movements. Human morality is something that we want to create our own truth. But that doesn't make it true. God determines truth. You see, God is not made in our image and our truth. We are made in God's image and only his truths. Come go with me again to verse 33. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you king of the Jews? So when my daughter and son-in-law were here a couple of weeks ago for spring break, we play a lot of cards. I mean, a lot of cards. And one night we're playing cards and um, the boys are just ganging up on my daughter. And it's a, it's a game where you can manipulate the deck. I mean, there was lots of moving parts. And they're just all night not letting Mackenzie win, beating her, beating her, beating her. And so it comes around, and they thought it was fun. Mama didn't think it was fair. <laughs> and so it comes around. It's one of those card games where you can draw a card out of someone else's hand. Well, I knew the cards she needed. And so she goes and she calls me that she's going to draw a card from me. And I give her a little sly grin, which she did not catch on to. And I raise the card a little higher. And she says, why are you raising that card higher? She refused to cheat. Now, you know, I, they started ganging up on me the rest of the night. She refused to cheat. Pilate is pulling up that card to give Jesus a way out. Jesus refuses to cheat. Jesus knows that he must go to the cross. There are no outs. There are no cheating. And so we keep going on, and title, the title that, um, they put, that Pilate puts on him there, it said, King of the Jews. That title was meant to belittle and mock the Jews. You see, that title, if he is king of the Jews, he's exempt from any Roman penalties. So when Jesus is called king of the Jews, that means he's a Jewish problem. And if it was a Jewish religious problem, Pilate could be done with Jesus. He could release him. But Jesus would not cheat his way out of the cross. That would bring ultimate victory. Victory for us. Look there in 32. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. I don't want you to miss the love of our Father here. He is placing Pilate in the best position to know the truth about Jesus. He's in an audience with Jesus. He's in a private conversation with Jesus. And each opportunity that God gives to Pilate to place his faith in Jesus, to be curious and ask Jesus what the truth is, Satan comes along and he gives him an out. And each time we see that Pilate is consistently choosing the out. Pilate lives in the almost. Girls, what opportunity is God offering us right now that we are teetering in that dangerous space of almost obedience? God even sent Pilate's wife, and we learn in the other Gospels, he sends Pilate's wife 
to, uh, to him, and she's had this terrible dream, and she says, don't do anything to that innocent man. God's love sometimes comes in warnings. God's opportunities to direct us sometimes comes in a warning. Pilate is speaking with Jesus himself, and he's received ample warning from God, and yet he has judged Jesus not worthy of his personal faith. Then we learn in Luke. So Luke tells us that Pilate, somewhere in this conversation, overhears that Jesus is from Galilee. And so look back up there in 33. He starts manipulating another out. This is an out for himself. So Galilee is in Herod Antipas's jurisdiction. So that's his out. This isn't my jurisdiction. Send him on down the road. And so he sends him to Herod Antipas. Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. If you guys remember him, he's the one that when Jesus was born, he ordered all the male babies to be killed. See, that was Satan then trying to prevent Jesus. But we know Jesus came through that. Antipas, his son, is the party guy. He's the party guy that beheaded John the Baptist. And so this is who Jesus is getting sent to. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. And so Herod Antipas, he pulls Jesus before him, and it talks about he wants Jesus to entertain him. He even asks Jesus for some party tricks, do some miracles, some signs. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't even speak to him. Because sometimes our silence is the more Christian route to go. So Antipas, this ticks him off, Antipas throws Jesus to this pack of soldiers and they put on quite an entertaining show. They beat Jesus, they make fun of him, they dress him up in a robe for Antipas to get a good laugh. Then he sends Jesus back to Pilate. So him and Pilate at one time hated each other. And somewhere in between sending Jesus to and fro, they form a bond over the torture of Jesus. These enemies become allies. The Bible says that they became friends. Let's go forward, 34 through 37. We see Jesus' response to, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, replied Pilate? Your own people, your own priest handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. So Jesus' kingdom that he's talking about was then, it's now, and it's yet to come. The kingdom of God comes when the gospel is heard, when it's shared, and people personally embrace Christ's rule in their hearts. The kingdom of God awaits the final glory for when Jesus returns. Then all people All people, even Pilate, will have to recognize that Jesus is king. And Jesus here, he's asking Pilate, Pilate, do you personally want to know who I am? The lips of Jesus, do you personally want to know who I am? Well, Pilate doesn't. And Jesus says, are you just appeasing Jewish leaders that have already predetermined that I'm going to be condemned to die? Pilate almost heard the plan of salvation from Jesus. But with his consistent selfishness, his closed ears to the truth, he has accumulated almost moments with Jesus. He rejects the opportunity. Girls, when we choose to live in the almost obedient side of Christian life, our service and our reward opportunities will eventually be given to someone else. 
And we won't know. We won't know the impact of what we've done until we stand before Jesus and he's handing out rewards and he comes to us and he passes us over because we had no rewards. We missed all the opportunities for reward because we chose to live in the almost. All right, back to Pilate. So Pilate answers Jesus with just this sarcasm. Look how Jesus handles this. This is a great example for us to tuck away in our minds. Jesus did not get angry. He did not argue. He didn't even summon the angels. Guys, we need to form a protest and get loud. He didn't even do that. How did Jesus handle it? He told the truth. He calmly told the truth. Are we Christ-like truth-tellers? Or are we just angry Christians? So Pilate looks in the face of truth incarnate. And he says, what is truth? See, Romans didn't believe in absolute truths. What a win for Satan to convince a nation that the truth is bendable and optional. Pilate being this political peace manipulator, he's digging and he finds a truth that he can bend with Jesus. Ah, it's tradition to release a Jewish prisoner on Passover. And so he puts Jesus up there as this loophole. Think about how um, our presidents pardon a turkey at Thanksgiving. But the Jews call out for Barabbas. It's possible that Barabbas was one of those zealot leaders, a dagger man. We, we know from the Bible that he did commit murder. And I wondered, as I was reading this, as Barabbas is coming out of the cell and Jesus is walking to the cross, as they pass, the innocent man taking the guilty man's place, did Barabbas remember that moment? Don't know. What we do know, girls, that believers, we were once Barabbases. We were Pilots. We were Herod Antipas. We were the sinners in the angry crowd. Guilty, dirty in our sins with all the other non-believers. Until we embraced Jesus as our king. Jesus who was pure, became dirty so we could become clean. And that's an absolute truth. Our first truth today. Jesus surrendered his life so believers could have eternal life. The plan of salvation required that Jesus die as a sinless sacrifice to atone for the sinful lives of of humankind, of us. And that sacrifice was offered to all sinners, even Pilate. God pursued Pilate with the truth, and that truth that Pilate almost listened to, but rejected. What truth is Jesus pursuing us with that we are rejecting? Our second division today. Jesus punished by Pilate, John 19, 1 through 16. So Pilate's reading the crowd, and he sees, okay, these guys are not going to back down. So maybe if I give them a little, maybe if I compromise and give them some affliction, they'll let go of the conviction. And so 19, 1, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Pilate is compromising what he knows to be true. And he knows to be true that Jesus is innocent. But he's willing to compromise that truth. Girls, when we start down the road of compromise with the truths of the Bible, you better believe that there is a Satan-sized hole in that road waiting for us. Compromising God's truth is the same thing as agreeing with Satan's lies. And so Pilate begins possibly, probably, unknowingly, entertaining Satan and his demons with the torture of Jesus. 
before we try and justify the position of Pilate, before we try and start feeling sorry for himself or for Pilate, I want you to consider the savagery of what Pilate ordered on his own accord to be inflicted upon our Jesus. You see, I have that flagrum there in that picture. That's strands of leather, metal, sharp bone. Some people say that it had sharp glass in it. And historians record that 39 lashes were typical for one being condemned to death to go to the cross. So you get the, fla the floggings before the cross. The flagrum would rip veins, it would rip arteries, skin. Some of them even recorded that it would go so deep in one's back that the kidneys would be exposed. Some of them never made it to the cross because the flogging was deadly. Let's go to two through three. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it in his head. They clothed him in purple, some of your versions may say scarlet there, robe, and went up to him and again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. So I think I have, those are modern day pictures. Um, Tammy from Area Team went and she took those pictures, shared them with us. So with Pilate's permission, Jesus was stripped of everything but this crown of thorns. And so we remember from our studies in Genesis and Matthew that the crown of thorns that these wicked soldiers took time to weave together, it's going to symbolize the suffering that Jesus would do, but it was Jesus would take on this crown to remedy the original curse on man for his sin in the Garden of Eden. If you remember Adam, which this applies to all of us, when he sinned, he was cursed with thorns when he toiled the soil. This was because of his sin. And so the soldiers are literally pressing humankind's sin symbol, the curse of thorns, into Jesus' flesh. So the soldiers are mocking Jesus. The soldiers are mocking Jesus as being inferior to the emperor who wore a golden crown of laurels. Soldiers were also given crowns of laurels, and it was upon great victories, military victories, um, great battles that where they had defeated the enemy, so they would come and they would get to wear this crown of laurels. See, the Romans believed that crowns held power that truly embodied their belief and their value system. They thought these crowns spoke louder than saying the words. Little did they know that Jesus' crown of thorns would symbolize the power of the gospel's beliefs and values. But Jesus, he willingly accepted this crown of thorns. See, it's going to represent the success of his mission to offer salvation to sinners, and it's going to celebrate his defeat of the enemy. Believers, his victory is our victory because we live on the other side of the cross. And on the other side of the cross, Jesus is wearing a heavenly crown that is now firmly in place, and he is reigning over all now. Girlfriend, when we pray for victory in our lives, don't be surprised if God asks you to bear some thorns. These soldiers that are putting this crown on Jesus, they are perhaps splattered by Jesus' blood. Perhaps they are splintered hands by the flagrum that they whipped him with, pricked by the thorns of the crown. They are standing so close to salvation, almost. But instead, they mock him with an inferior crown, a scepter, and a robe. Do we mock Jesus by wearing his robe of righteousness with a casual stride, carrying a scepter of self on the way to crown our own will superior to his? 
Let's look at verses 6 through 9. This is how the Jewish leaders respond to the beating of Jesus. As soon as the chief priest and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. At this point, Pilate's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, what did you just say? And it says, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. He's getting serious here, and he says, where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. So there in verse 8, it says, even more afraid. This title, Son of God, was very familiar to the Romans. When Caesar Augustus was in power, he declared himself the son of a God. And with the passage of power down to each Caesar, they were declared the son of a God. This is a Roman problem now. This is looking like Pilate is in trouble for possible treason. Jesus is this hot political potato that he needs to get rid of fast. It would help him up until a point. He would almost help Jesus. When you start talking about the emperor, equating yourself to him, we got a Roman problem now. And the Roman problem affects Pilate. So Pilate stops playing with Jesus and he asks the question, where are you from? You see, Remember Herod the Great? Pilate sends Jesus over to Herod Antipas. Herod the Great was the guy who killed the babies, right? Pilate would have known that story. Did none of those babies live? Where are you from? Are you the one that Herod the Great tried to get rid of? I don't know. We don't know where his thoughts were. Lots of possibilities. But the question that he's asking is born out of complete political fear, no personal interest. There is power in Jesus' silence to Pilate's questions because Pilate doesn't want to understand the truth. And Jesus understands this now. He knows his heart. Jesus, who stands in absolute authority and truth, doesn't feel the need to defend to Pilate what Jesus knows to be true. But Pilate was playing defense against Jesus, against the truth, since the very beginning when Jesus was brought to him. Let's look at how he does this. When Pilate first told the Jewish leaders to take care of Jesus yourself, he's doing the defensive game of pawning the problem off on someone else. When Pilate replied to Jesus with, Am I a Jew? The defense of directing conversation away from someone, away from yourself, So your own shame doesn't get exposed? When Pilate jokes about Jesus being king of the Jews, or he responds with intellectual garbage of what is truth, this cocky response perpetuates spiritual and emotional avoidance. And girls, when we do that, it puts us in a comfortable position so we don't have to change. Then look in verse 10. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have the power either to free you or to crucify you? This is another defense mechanism of Pilate's. He's using rationalization or the projection of perceived power to get what he wants. But Pilate's misguided perceived power is nothing compared to Jesus who is all-powerful that stands before him. Are we guilty of defensive behaviors, these um, moments of manipulations when we're asked to serve Jesus, when we're asked to accept a hard truth that's in the Bible, or when we're given some helpful criticism? Pilate, with great pomp and drama, some of the other Gospels talk about how he does this elaborate hand-washing. So with all this drama... It's a personal defense. And he decides to give the Jews what they want. 
be done with Jesus. I'm willing to kill an innocent man to keep my job. I'm willing to kill an innocent man to keep the peace. The compromise had grown into such as murder for Pilate. Let's look at verses 13 through 14. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. So only the governor could uh, pronounce death sentences. And when they were ready to pronounce a death sentence, they didn't just come out and pronounce it from the porch. There was a judgment seat that they had to go sit in. And so they would go to this judgment seat, and this judgment seat was elevated so all the crowd could see. When he sat down at the judgment seat, he knew it was to convict Jesus. He knew it was to murder Jesus. He had prepared the sacrificial lamb for Passover. Pilate had wanted peace in the land. Therefore, he would crucify the innocent lamb, that is Jesus. And in doing that, Pilate positioned himself against peace with God. You see, Pilate almost knew the peace of Jesus that passes all understanding. Almost but almost left him a fully condemned sinner. Pilate hands Jesus over to the fate of the cross. Our truth. Jesus suffered great pain so believers could have great peace. The peace Jesus offers provides the eternal peace that our souls crave. Freedom from sin's curse, it gives us restoration in our relationship with God. Where, what, or who are we seeking our peace from? Are we doing the less than? Are we compromising everlasting peace for these cheap, brief moments of peace that the world offers us? In that Duke Butler game in March Madness that we talked about at the beginning, there was someone who was completely overshadowed by that almost made shot by Gordon Haywood. It was Duke's Brian Zubek. You see, Butler had shot and missed. Brian Zubek gets the rebound and is filed, failed. He gets put on the free shot line and he makes that first free shot. And that was the shot that sealed the deal for Duke's win. See, Brian's first shot did go in, and it won them the title of national championships. Girls, Satan will use all kinds of things within him as limited power to overshadow the victor, Jesus, who defeated sin and death. But Satan loses, and Jesus wins maintaining the title as king over all creation. Will you pray with me? Oh, Jesus, our lamb, our lion of Judah, thank you. Thank you for willingly taking that crown. Thank you for willingly taking the beatings. Thank you for standing when you wanted to just fall. Lord, let us live our lives in honor of all that you did for us. Show us how, Lord. And God, be a part of our conversations. Speak to these women, Lord. Speak to their hearts as they speak to each other about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh.